Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Uh, so again, all these slides are, are free for your use as long as you reference where you got them. Um, oh, I'll just speak into the microphone. Okay, great. So in this module, we're going to discuss data visualization, uh, which actually plays a pretty important role in genomic research and makes it possible to observe outliers, uh, correlations, and trends in large data sets, which is critical first to understanding your data uh, and second to fine-tuning parameters and steps of your analytical pipeline. Uh, so increasingly, visualization is performed numerous times uh, throughout your analytical pipeline rather than just at the end on the final result of your workflow when you want to generate a figure. So hopefully by the end of the module and the lab, you'll have um, a better understanding of the kinds of tools available for visualization and specifically you'll have lots of hands-on experience uh, with inspecting variants in a genome browser. So the, um, the talk is organized in two parts. Um, um, in the first part, we're going to look at, um, uh, just discuss a couple of visualization tools and specifically genome browsers and we'll have an overview of IGV. And in the second part, we're going to talk in a bit more detail about single nucleotide polymorphisms and structural variants. Uh, there are lots of other things you can do with IGV. You can look at splicing information if you have RNA-seq data. Uh, you can look at uh, lots of different kinds of data that we don't have time to go over today. So I encourage you to look up the IGV tutorial from the Broad, uh, which has 200 slides on basically everything you can do with IGV. So, First, I want to just spend a couple of slides convincing you that visualization is a process that is really useful to your analysis. Uh, and in contrast to the other computing tasks uh, that we're going to talk about in this workshop, it's something that in many cases the human brain can actually do better than a computer. Uh, so let's talk about one compelling example of this. Uh, this is a famous uh, data set called Ascom's Quartet, uh, which comprises four sets of two variables each. So we see the four data sets here. Each has an X and a Y. Um, we can stare at this matrix all day and uh, it's not going to tell us much. Uh, typically summary statistics like averages uh, or variance of each X and Y uh, is one way to do a high level comparison. But in this particular case, in all four data sets, the X and Y summaries uh, are identical. So from the summaries, you might conclude that the data sets are identical until we actually visualize the distributions. So when we do that, uh, we see the real relationships start to emerge. So data set one is a, is a set of points that are roughly linear uh, with some variance. Uh, the second data set fits a curve. The third one is a very tight linear relationship with one outlier. Um, and in data set four, with one exception, x is constant in every case. So you, you can immediately see um, with your eyes that these are different data sets, although you're not going to get that from summary statistics. So a visual check is very quick and effective, um, which is one strength, uh, and the other strength is the ability to identify outliers. And this is very important in, uh, in designing your workflow because outliers are typically what we look for, at, you know, SNVs, uh, rearrangements, uh, all, all these things are outliers which are going to be rare in the genome. So identification of outliers is, um, is something that, that we can do amazingly fast uh, visually without much conscious effort. And this is a, a process called pre-attentive processing. I don't know if anyone's heard in the audience about pre-attentive processing before. Hands? No hands? No. Okay. Well, it basically means the stuff you notice right away. So our brains have the capability of, um, of capturing things like color, shape, and size. Um, and processing them without any conscious effort. So we can tell immediately when part of an image is different from the rest without really having to even focus on it. Uh, so in an example like this one uh, on the top right, um, where uh, basically there are only one or two differences where everything else is the same, it's very easy to spot the outlier. Um, have you guys um, seen a Where's Waldo book before? Can I show of hands? So some people haven't. So this is a very uh, nice example of finding where's Waldo. Here's a more typical example. Um, up here on the left, you can see uh, where Waldo normally hangs out, which is a scene that has a great variety of shapes and colors and no obvious trend. And typically, that's just a scenario that def defeats our pre-attentive processing. Um, and actually, researchers at MIT have used eye-tracking devices to um, 
uh, to observe how people go about finding Waldo in a case like this. And so here's a typical search. This jagged line is the path of the eye as it scans across the page and checks every face and goes on and eventually ends in success uh, where this pink dot is. So this is a sequential process. It's called attentive, process, uh, attentive processing. It lets us focus on one thing at a time and it takes a really long time. So in general, we want our data visualization to be effortless um, and therefore we want um, uh, our visualization tools to emphasize those attributes that are critical to successful pre-attentive processing. So these are things like color, shape, size, um, and the visualization tools developed for genomics have really emphasized uh, the adoption of these features in the user interface, as we shall see later in the slides and also in the lecture or in, in, in the lab. So here are some examples of, of cases where it's very easy to spot outliers. So to summarize, we want to visualize so that we can identify patterns and outliers, um, and we want to do so in a fast and efficient way. So what tools can we use to visualize data? Well, it really depends on what your data is and how much of it you have. Um, let's suppose you're looking at interchromosomal structural rearrangement in a large cohort of patients. You might want to generate circles plot, for instance. Some of you may have seen these circular plots where you can draw lines that connect uh, different parts of the genome which are, which are connected. If you're looking at mutations, you can use a genome br browser like IGV or Savant. Um, privacy is another important consideration, especially when working with patient-derived data. Uh, so in that case, you want to make sure, for instance, that you don't have to upload your data to some, uh, to some place on the web that's not secured. Uh, so that being said, genome browsers are typically a very good option uh, for a light to thorough investigation in most cases, uh, including those where privacy is a, is a consideration. So yesterday I counted uh, actually 49 different genome browsers built by different teams for different purposes. Uh, most of them solve the core challenge of being able to uh, interactively look at various types of high throughput data in the context of a reference genome. So that genome can be human, mouse, fly, pathogens. I know some of you guys are doing pathogen analysis. Um, and there are actually specific browser it, uh, browsers, it turns out, for facilitating that type of analysis that I haven't personally worked with before, but apparently um, it's a niche that, that definitely has tools in it. Uh, so if the task at hand is visualizing alignments to the genome, inspecting variants, all the things we're going to look today, look at today, um, genome browsers are a great tool. Uh, they can handle large files stored either lo locally or remotely, and they can keep that data private. Um, IGV is, is actually the most highly used and fully featured browser, and the one we're going to spend today uh, talking about. But another popular one is the UCSC Genome Browser, and an offshoot of that is the UCSC Cancer Genome Browser that lets you browse various cancer-specific data sets. Um, Trackster, um, which is built on top of the Genomic Workbench Galaxy, uh, which is going to be in Module 7, um, and the Savant browser, which has plugin style analytical tools. Uh, these kinds of browsers can perform visual analysis, um, or sorry, uh, they can perform analytics uh, coupled with visual analysis. Um, so there are lots of choices up there, and depending on your analysis needs, I encourage you to take a look at, at a few of them. So for the rest of the talk, we'll, we'll focus in more detail on the IGV, the Integrative Genomics Viewer. Um, its design is basically focused to integrate uh, genomic studies. So it has support for both array-based um, and next-generation sequencing data. Um, and it can integrate this together with clinical or phenotypic data. So a user can visualize and explore their own data set. Uh, or a, a user can explore any publicly available data set, or a user can integrate public and private data sets together, which is extremely useful. So I just want to mention before we go on that the following slides, uh, which have the Broad logo in the top right here, um, are in part adapted from the Broad's IGV tutorial, which is an excellent resource. So uh, just quickly noting some of the uh, features of IGV, uh, the user interface is pretty intuitive and easy to learn, and we're going to learn it today. Um, like I said, it can integrate multiple data types with clinical information. So someone might have sequencing data on top of copy number data, on top of expression data from the same patients, and you can load all those in IGV along with clinical information and do all sorts of um, 
of sorts and visualizations on, on that uh, full set. Um, it can pull data from local or remote uh, locations, and it also allows automation of certain tasks um, using what's called a, a batch job. So these can be invoked uh, while running an IGV session. So later we'll have an IGV session in progress, and we're going to go through a number of examples, and then at the end of the lab, we're going to invoke a batch job that will just do everything we did manually in one go. Um, it can also be used non-interactively. For instance, uh, you can invoke IGV on the command line and pass, pass it a batch file and say, IGV open in the background, do everything I've specified in the batch file. For instance, take a snapshot of the read alignments at every SNV of interest, uh, produce a file in a specific directory, and then close. And it will do that. And then all you have to do is go through the files one by one and just identify regions that might look messy or that you'd want to look um, further into in more detail. So it, depending on, how you, on what your task is, there are different ways to use it. Um, and as we'll see in the lab, in the same session of IGV, uh, again, we can uh, view local files, which we're going to do, uh, in a secure environment. And at the same time, we can view remote files from public data sets without actually downloading these, which is very useful if you want to look at a lot of big data that's out there and you don't want to host it on your own system. Okay, so in the next part of the talk, uh, we'll take a quick look at how IGV is launched. Um, how we select a genome reference and load data, and we'll take a quick look at what whole genome sequencing looks like, uh, which Matei gave us a brief glimpse of. Uh, and finally, we'll go over some more in-depth examples of SNVs and structural variants so that we have a good understanding of these before we uh, get to the practical exercises of the lab. So launching IGV is pretty easy. On the IGV website, um, there's a download button. Uh, and if we click on this, uh, we're taken to a page where we can simply launch IGV with a certain amount of predefined memory, um, and this is the easiest way to do it. Alternatively, uh, we can install the application locally, so you could just download IGV and run it from your, from your computer, and if you want to uh, invoke IGV command line, that, that, that's the way you would do it. The graphical user interface that comes up is divided into a number of controls and panels. Um, at the top left is a command bar with controls for selecting a reference genome, which has to be chosen first before loading any data. Um, IGV provides dozens of hosted genome uh, uh, references to choose from, um, but it also allows you to uh, add your own. So if you're sequencing a novel, if, you're, if your genome of interest is not there, you could add your own. Uh, you just need a FASTA file. Data files can be loaded in multiple, multiple ways, as I mentioned. You can use the built-in file browser to select a file from your uh, local system, or you can enter in a URL if uh, the file is hosted somewhere on the internet, or you can select entries from the server menu. Uh, by default, this menu provides access to data and annotation files that are hosted um, at the Broad Institute, specifically for viewing an IGV. So this is a lot of public data uh, you can explore uh, this menu when we pull up IGV in the lab. Um, in this particular example, we're going to load some ChIP-seq data representing, representing uh, four epigenetic marks profiled in one individual. So again, this is the GM individual that uh, we've talked about before. So this is what happens when we load these four tracks. Uh, we see four horizontal lines come up in the data panel of the window. So just to label these all these different parts of the window, um, um, we go to the next slide and we see that this is the data panel. Um, up here is a toolbar that has um, a, a couple of uh, um, cl clicking functionality so we can turn certain things on and off and we'll play with this in the lab. Uh, we also have pull down menus. Um, and in the genome ruler section, we see that we are actually zoomed out to see um, alignments against the whole genome. So in this case, we see um, that we're, the, we're looking at the uh, human genome ref, uh, reference, and we see chromosomes 1 to y. If we were zoomed into a particular chromosome, we would also see the ideogram, like Matei showed us earlier, with a red square over the region that we're actually browsing in. Uh, the remainder of the window is divided into one or more data panels and an attribute panel, uh, which mm -hmm. I forgot to label. 
uh, but it's right here. It's the, the set of this matrix of colored bars. Um, so basically, a sample or uh, the, the the data from each sample or patient is displayed as one horizontal row. Each one is called a track. If any sample or track attributes have been loaded, for instance, um, age or sex of the patient or data type, perhaps, uh, these will be displayed as a color-coded matrix um, in the attribute panel. So this can be sorted on, for instance, if you're looking at primary versus recurrent disease, you could sort on, you want to see mutation, if your mutations cluster with primary disease or recurrent disease, and, and so on and so forth. And at the bottom, we see genome features, which are loaded by default. By default, these are RefSeq genes. You can load any annotations here. You can, row, you can load a different uh, version of genes, ensemble genes, perhaps. You can load transcription factor binding sites or any annotation that, that is basically mapped to the genome. Uh, IGB currently supports more than 30 different file formats, uh, including many of the common formats for genome annotations, as I mentioned, RefSeq, so all these uh, genomic or gene annotation sequence alignments, um, so BAM files uh, that we uh, generated uh, earlier today, variant calls, microarray data, copy number data, the, the full fi file format list is available um, at this link. But ba basically the file format defines the track type that IGB will launch when you load a file, um, and that track type determines predefined display options. So in our case, when we're looking at sequencing data, um, the files are in BAM format, and the track type is therefore in alignment. Uh, if we're zoomed out too far, uh, and in this case you can see here the chromosome ideogram, um, we can't see individual reads yet because it would take too much memory to load them all. Um, but we do see a message that tells us we have to get closer. So you know when you're zoomed out too far to, uh, to see your data that you just have to zoom in a bit more. What we can see in this view is actually a bar chart of read coverage here. Um, so it's, it's this, these gray uh, bars. And um, you can see that the coverage is fairly uniform along the chromosome uh, until we get to the centromeres, which are areas with typically a very high repetitive content. Uh, and so you usually get a huge bump at, the, at those locations. So that's a typical coverage plot of a chromosome. Uh, we need to zoom in to about 30, uh, 30 kilo, kilobase window in order to start to see our alignments. Although this is a threshold that can be changed uh, depending on what your data is like. So if you have very high depth data, maybe you did really high uh, depth exome sequencing, then you would want to um, uh, perhaps uh, lower your... Um, so you'd want to... Um, uh, you'd want to modify your settings to take into account whether you have maybe low-pass genomes or high-depth exomes. Um, and it will also depend on how much memory you're running IGB with. So that's something to play around with. Uh, when we zoom in sufficiently, IGB uses color and transparency uh, to highlight interesting events. So these are outliers. Uh, so we're going to look for outliers in the data, and it's going to visually de-emphasize things that are not outliers. So we can see individual read alignments as these horizontal bars, these gray bars. Uh, the direction of each read is denoted by the pointy end of the bar. So each bar has one flat end and one pointy end that points in the direction uh, because these reads are inward facing. The gray color in this case indicates that the mapping quality is good. So, there, so all these reads are mapping with good quality at this location in the genome. Um, now the color bars that we see here, um, in the, both in the reads and in the bar chart of coverage, these indicate locations where a large number of read bases mismatch the reference. Um, so these are helpful in identifying putative SNPs. Um, the relative size and color of these bars indicates the allelic frequency at each base. So in this case, we can see that um, the allelic frequency of the alternate uh, base, in this case a T, which is color-coded blue, is almost 100%, so this is a homozygous mutation or polymorphism. Um, so, so this will give you an idea of the allelic frequency, and the intensity of the color gives you an idea of the quality of that base. Uh, so we can see here in the inset that, um, high, that positions with high base quality will have a very strong color, and position with low base quality will have a very uh, 
weak or very transparent color. So for instance, this particular case in the top read on the right, um, this G, it's a very light orange. That's a very poor quality call. So we wouldn't really trust calls like that for um, uh, um, as evidence of an SNB. So there are a number of metrics that are useful, like base qualities, in evaluating whether a SNP is valid or a polymorphism is valid. Um, and the same for structural variance. Uh, so for SNVs, in addition to base quality, we're going to consider read coverage, um, the allelic frequency of the alternate base, uh, strand bias, and mapping quality of the reads. For structural variance, uh, we'll take a look at coverage and most importantly, insert size and read pair orientation. So examples are the best way to consider these ma matrix. So let's go over uh, a couple of examples for SNVs. In this case, um, this is an SNV that changes a, a C to a T. So we can see when we are zoomed in enough at the bottom here, we can see the actual uh, sequence of the reference. So we can see that this should be a C and in this patient uh, we see a T. We also see that there's decent read coverage. Um, the, there's a little number here, I don't know if you guys can read it, it's 50. That's the highest bar on the bar chart. So the read, there are 50 reads covering this position and you can see that it's a heterozygous uh, SNP. So it's about 60% T and 40% uh, C. Uh, the color transparency in most of these cases looks really good, so the base quality is actually quite high. Uh, obviously, we'd want to scroll down and see all the reads, but this would look like a decent candidate for a real SNP. Uh, in the second example, um, we can see that the reference allele, which is an A, is changed to a C, but only in about 30% of the reads. So here the reads are color-coded. Uh, the reads on the forward strand are colored pink, and the reads on the reverse strand are colored blue. Then the alignments are sorted by base. So the things with a different base than the reference show up at the top. And what you can see here is, is immediately obvious is that there's a strand bias for this alternate base call. So the C only shows up on the reverse strand reads. Um, and after this mismatch, you can see that there are additional mismatches in all of these reads. So this is, this is kind of a super obvious artifact and not a true variant. So this is, a, this is what you'd look for to exclude variants. Okay, uh, we'll do more uh, variants in the lab. Uh, I'm gonna switch now to talk about structural events, uh, which aren't as straightforward to interpret. Um, so we're gonna spend a few slides talking, talking about um, how they're detected. Um, so we'll start off with deletions, translocations, and inversions. Oh, and by the way, feel free to interrupt at any point. Um, I'm happy to answer questions if something doesn't make sense. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to keep going. But feel free to, to ask questions, yes. Is there an actual difference between SNVs and SNPs? Yeah, so uh, the question is, are there differences between SNVs and SNPs? So polymorphisms are things that are, um, that are changes... Uh, found just in the, in the general population at, at a certain frequency. Um, so we have 3 billion base pairs, we're going to have 3 million SNPs. Each person has an average of 3 million SNPs. And these are going to be found at some percentage in different populations. Um, SNVs are usually um, somatic uh, mutations. And so in a tumor, so they're not germline. So a SNP will be inherited from your parents. A polymorphism will be inherited from your parents. A variant, which would be an interesting thing to look for in cancer analysis, for instance, is something that is systematically acquired in a tumor. Um, or at least it's very rare in the population and it's usually, it can be deleterious. So in a, in a normal cell uh, population, you'd have everyone being the same and in a tumor you would have heterogeneity and that would so in the patients, so for somatic SNVs, we would look for cases where there's um, a mutation in a tumor and not in the germline of that individual, which means that, which would indicate that that variant is somehow potentially involved in uh, disease initiation or progression. Um, there are germline um, <coughs> variants that can cause predisposition to disease. Um, but those are a bit more rare, and those would be rare in a general population. 
Um, so they're typically, I think the threshold for our, when we do SNP analysis is we exclude anything that's found in more than 1% of the population. And if it's found in less than 1% of the population, we might keep it in uh, for further analysis. Yeah? So for, for the IGV, at the beginning, you have to choose the reference genome. Yes. The, the data was already aligned before that. So if we are given the file, how can we know what reference genome? So the question is, how do we know what reference genome was used to align our data? Um, typically, well, if you've done the data alignment yourself, yeah. you will know. If you haven't done the data alignment yourself, it may say in the BAM header. So the BAM file always has a header, and depending on the parameters that were used to run the alignment, um, in, in many cases, the tool and the version of the genome that was used uh, of the reference genome will be reported. Um, if that's not the case and you're pulling data from a public repository, it should say um, it, it should say wherever it is your like if it's a geo data set, it'll say this was an HG18 human um, data set. So I would definitely um, you will also if you have RNA seq data quickly figure out if you're in the wrong uh, genome because your reads won't match exons. So if you're looking at RNA-seq data and you forgot to uh, change the default from HG18 to HG19 and you load HG19 data on the HG18 references, you'll see very nice peaks of reads that correspond to exons, which are nowhere near the real exons or are shifted. And so that'll be a really good clue that, uh, that something needs to be changed. Ah, yes. So in, in the BAM file, it might or might not contain information about the reference, but it will always contain the length of the column. Yeah. So that's, but it's like a last resort kind of thing. You should compare the length of the uh, chromosomes in the BAM file with various references that might that are potential. Yeah. Oh, one more question. Yeah. I thought you could also Um, I'm pretty sure that when you're in one window, you're, you're always looking at data sets aligned to one reference sequence. So if you want to switch from mouse to human, you would run, I guess, two instances of IGV. One where you're loading the mouse genome as a reference and one where you load the human genome as a reference. That's a good question. Um, okay, so let's talk about structural variants. Um, we're going to look at deletions, translocations, and inversions. These are a bit more complicated to investigate. And we're going to rely on two main sources of evidence in considering them, inferred insert size and pair orientation. So let's talk about um, why these are important. First, by briefly just reviewing how sequencing data is generated. Uh, so very briefly, DNA is um, isolated, and then it's fragmented. And those fragments are actually size selected, typically all these fragments are run on a gel and people cut out a band around a certain size of interest. So if you're making a library of uh, 350 base pair fragments, you would cut out a very tight band around 350 and then you would um, uh, continue on with library of prep just using those sequences. So most fragments when you do this, um, if you look at fragment distribution after your size selection, you'll see that most of them It'll be a normal distribution with a mean around 350, if that's the band that you cut out. And then there will be some fragments that are slightly bigger and slightly smaller. So it's going to be a kind of a normal distribution around that. So that's a bit of critical info to keep in mind. Um, adapters are then added uh, to the ends of each of these fragments. Um, these are denoted by these little orange uh, bits on the end. And reads are generated from each end, as Mate told us. So the insert size is actually the actual insert size is the length of this DNA molecule between the two sequence fragments. Um, we had a question previously of how long are your reads versus the, the fragment. Typically, we read because the longer your reads are, the more errors you get. So typically, with Lumina sequencing, we do 100 base pair paired end reads. That's like the most most data is like uh, is like that today, uh, or 150 or 125. Um, so usually, if you have a 350 base pair fragment or longer, you're going to be able to read the ends, 
and in the middle you'll miss. But because you're generating so many fragments which are going to be overlapping in nature, you'll be able to tile the reeds across the whole region. So when we align these reeds to the reference genome, um, we can measure what is called the inferred insert size. This is the distance between the starts uh, of the two reeds in the alignment. So if there's a consistent discrepancy, oh, let, me, let me just go back to the slide for a second. If everything is perfect and your library size is perfect and everything is at the mean of 350, then the actual uh, insert size will be 350 and the inferred insert size will be 350. If we see consistent deviations from this scenario, that would be evidence um, of a deletion or an insertion. When read pairs actually map to different chromosomes, that's evidence of a translocation. Um, and obviously the inferred insert size cannot be calculated in those cases. Okay, so let's look at a deletion. Um, in, in such a case, how does the library insert size differ from the inferred insert size? Well, let's look uh, step by step. In our sequence subject on the bottom, we have a portion of the genome deleted. So it's gone. The subject's DNA is then fragmented, and this fragment is uh, the right size, uh, 350 base pairs, let's say. It's sequenced, and the reads are now aligned to the genome, which still contains that portion that's deleted in our subject. So the reads are going to align much further apart than we would expect. Um, and so in the case of deletion, the inferred insert size is always larger than the expected size based on the library preparation protocol. And um, uh, to find such events visually, IGV has an option to color alignments by insert size. So when we right click on um, the, uh, the, the data panel, uh, the name panel, we get a lot of options for how to color code or sort or group our alignments. And in this case, uh, we would color alignments by insert size. And this is what we would see in the case of a deletion. This is a 15 kilo base uh, heterozygous deletion. We know it's a deletion because the read pairs uh, have very large insert sizes and are colored red. Um, we also see that there are still reads in the deleted region. So um, it's not complete, it's not homozygously deleted. Uh, so one could conclude that it's a heterozygous deletion, although there's, there are other possibilities. Does, can anyone think of a different possibility? <coughs> It could be, for instance, that this is a, a tumor sample and there's heterogeneity. And so in half of the cells in the tumor, it's a homozygous deletion. And in half of the cells of the tumor, there's no deletion at all. And when you pull all the cells together and sequence it, you're going to see this exact pattern. So um, tumor heterogeneity is, is kind of a, an additional layer of information that, that will affect the data, but we're not going to have time to talk about today. But just keep that in mind as, a, as another possibility if you're working with uh, cancer data. So similarly to deletions, which are colored red, insertions are colored blue. Um, and reads where one pair maps to another chromosome, um, uh, those reads have a different color code. So these are, or, uh, these are the codes that, colors that would mark a translocation. And it's e easiest to see by looking at an example. So here's an example of a translocation between chromosome 1 and 6. Um, brown is the color code for chromosome 6. So we know that all the partners of these chromosome 1 reads reside on chromosome 6 and vice versa. The partners uh, or the read pairs of all these reads on chromosome 6 actually reside on chromosome 1. Um, and this also highlights another feature of IGV, which um, I didn't talk about, which is that you can actually view multiple regions in the same window. So when you have something like this, you can split your view between the two different locations where your reads are mapping. Um, as an additional layer of information, uh, we can use read pair orientation to identify inversions, duplications, and uh, translocations, or even more complex rearrangements. Um, so we'll talk about uh, those in a little bit of detail. Uh, let's consider an inversion first, unless you guys have questions about the previous section. No. Okay, good. Uh, so we're going to consider an inversion. The segment of interest uh, in its normal orientation is, the, is in the reference genome is marked from A to B. It's this brown bar. In our subject that we're sequencing, this sequence is inverted, so we have B to A. Now when we generate libraries from the subject's 
uh, genomic DNA, some of our sequenced fragments will span the breakpoint. And when we align reads to the reference genome, the first read uh, is going to align to one side of the first breakpoint, so in the blue area of the reference genome. But the second read is going to align within the inverted uh, sequence and on the opposite strand. And similarly, on the other end, one read will align as expected beyond the second uh, breakpoint, and its pair is going to align on the opposite strand and within the inverted sequence. So we see this pattern um, when we look at real alignments. We see that both breakpoints will have alignments pointing in the same direction instead of inward facing, as we would expect. Uh, and there's a color code for this as well, so that we can easily identify these when we look uh, in a genome uh, browser. Teal is the code for read pairs corresponding to the breakpoint on the left of an inversion. And blue is the color code for reads corresponding to the breakpoint on the right of an inversion. So not surprisingly, we can select color by pair orientation to make these kinds of anomalies obvious in the browser. Um, and we can see what that would look like here. So this is the case where this region of the genome is inverted. Uh, we see a drop of coverage where fewer reads can be mapped to the, um, to the breakpoint. And we see that the reads that can be mapped um, have this specific pattern of blue, blue, uh, and, or teal, teal, and blue, blue, pointing in, in, the, in the same orientation. So this is a comprehensive chart um, of the color options for different kinds of mapping anomalies. Uh, this is available on the IGV website, and it always comes in useful when looking at data. We shall see an example of a translocation in the lab. This is the, these are reads that are color-coded green, um, so keep these colors in mind. Essentially, reads that are colored green are pointing outwards. Um, uh, we talked about the teal and the blue reads, and then the gray reads are, are ones that map in the expected pattern. So those, are, those will be most of the reads. Okay, so actually that only took 40 minutes for the um, uh, lecture, so now we're going to have plenty of time for the lab, I think, and we're going to delve in some fascinating examples of all these kinds of uh, scenarios. Um, and I think I'm going to uh, just delve into the lab right away. <laughs>